Hello, welcome to a new series. So, as you can see by this screen here, I'm calling the series Learn to Code, Code to Learn. And in this episode, we're going to be learning about Ruby. So hopefully you can go away and dive in, do some coding and learn about a programming language through coding. Or maybe just watch this presentation, if you like, um, and uh, yeah, just enjoy it for that. Um, obviously, as you can see by the screen, this uh, series is primarily aimed at um, cats and dogs that want to learn coding. But, you know, any humans out there, they're more than welcome to uh, participate in this. And I'm sure they'll, they'll learn just as much. So the important thing is to maybe put on your comfy coding cardigan and, um, and dive in. So before I start off and, and talk a little bit about Ruby, a um, couple of things, sort of housekeeping things with this. The overall plan with the series is, if you haven't seen my sort of introductory video that I put out a couple of weeks ago and I thought about doing this, it's based around the book Seven Languages in Seven Weeks, but what I'm doing is a twist on it and it incorporates lots of ideas that I've learned over the years in terms of learning stuff and uh, this is a template that you might want to learn or might want to utilize for yourself if you're into studying or you're a, a sort of self-directed learner like me um, it's to basically uh, yeah so so this is this is what I've decided to do is I'm I'm reading a chapter so in this case a chapter on Ruby uh, and I spend a week going through everything in that chapter. So the exercise is the self-directed learning at the end and anything else that sort of catches my fancy in terms of rabbit holes it opens up. Second week, I put together a PowerPoint presentation, this one here. And basically, I've got a framework, and you'll see what it is, that I'm intending on using in terms of all the bases I want to cover when I cover other languages. So I've tried to work out some sort of common commonalities across all languages. And so I'm going to go through those. And the idea is as I go through them, you sort of get to know more and more about the language in a bit of a sort of I don't know, revelatory words the right way. But but you'll see as we go through the, the form this is going to take. I've got some coding examples, but I'm not going to do live coding I, i've learned from my mistakes or at least live coding when i'm recording the video um yeah don't really want to go down that route however and I'll, I'll come on to this in a moment there is a sort of secondary layer to this so yeah that's the first two weeks so i read the book fully engage with the book upload all the code that i generate to my um github account and i'll be talking about that again at the end Spend the second week putting a presentation together about the language. And then weeks three and four are deep dives into the language. So I'm going to be working on various pet projects, probably re revolving around um, music discovery or something like that. All those, those aspects, um, I'm going to have some difficulty posting them to GitHub. I'll have to strip out the uh, API codes for where I'm using APIs. So yeah, that's the third and fourth weeks. But also... What I will be trying to do is thinking about if, if, it, if it's a requirement, if it turns out I need to do it, is doing a follow up video where I do maybe do a little bit of coding in Visual Studio Code in order to answer any questions that might come up in the comments section, if any, or any questions that have arose as a result of me spending two weeks doing a deep dive. So that's the plan and that's going to happen for every language. So expect a learn to code, code to learn video like this one to drop round about every month on the seven different languages and then possibly in the same month or within the same couple of weeks a second video if I feel the need arises to do that. Now if you want to set up to do any of these languages um, what I'm going to do and again at the end I'll, I'll, I'll mention this again but I'll include information in the description about where to go to download Ruby in this case 
Um, basically, it's very simple. What I usually do is I download the programming language, install it, make sure that it works at the command line, um, fire up Visual Studio Code, which is already on my system, find the appropriate um, community interface for, say, you know, debugging purposes, mainly just some sort of code highlighter. That's my main thing I like to do. Just make sure I've got a code highlighter for the language. Um, and that's pretty much it, really. And I just do everything then from Visual Studio Code and the command line in Visual Studio Code. So, yeah, that's really how I set everything up. So let's let's go through and talk about the language. Um, I would suggest you get yourself, a, uh, if you haven't done already, uh, a nice beverage or something because um, this could be a long one. 71 slides with narration. Talking about shit. Um, OK, so here we go. So just a little bit about Ruby. And again, I'm going to include links uh, to all the major Ruby information sites. So the Ruby main site itself and any related Wikipedia articles. And I'll put those in the description notes either. No, uh, description for the video so you don't have to write any of this down. So conceived in 1993 by um, Yukihiro Matsumoto, I think that is, also known as Mats who wanted a genuine object-oriented, easy-to-use scripting language. First released to the public in 1995, version 0 0.95. The first stable version, my understanding is, version 1.0 was released in 98. And the latest stable version, as of this video, which was released in 2023, the not the video, the video is 2024, um, I'm putting this together at the end of February 2024, actually. But they are the latest stable version of Ruby was released in 2023. That's version 3.3.0. And that one, I think, was released in November of 2023. Influenced by several other languages, such as Perl, Smalltalk, i4, Ada and Lisp. And there's a few other ones as well. And of course, it's gone on to influence in and of itself other languages. So that's cool. It's an interpreted, high-level, dynamic, open-source, general-purpose, multi-paradigm language. However, everything is an object, including primitive data types. And so everything has the capacity to have its own methods and attributes. And of course, that extends to stuff you might create in the language as well. It's got syntax that is designed to be easily understood and enjoyable to use. I believe that the word fun comes up a lot when using Ruby. And I must admit, I've had a lot of fun just the first couple of weeks. Well, I actually spent a little bit more longer than that um, on this particular one for the first try. So it's probably nearer three weeks now than two. Um, it has an active and passionate community who contribute to its evolution and maintenance. And the other thing to bear in mind, and I've put this on the about Ruby because I know I'm going to keep calling them functions. But if I use the term functions here, I apologize. They're really called methods, but they're the same thing, essentially. So in Ruby, functions are, called, are commonly called methods. But if I say the word function, what I really should say is methods. Yeah, in terms of the community, um, the other thing is I have noticed there's quite a bit of uh, podcast stuff about Ruby. So I include links in the description to those as well. So I think and I was debating where to start with this because it's always tricky when, with a language like this, which is enormous, um, like a lot of languages in terms of all the different cool things you can do. And it's difficult to know your angle in. So I thought I'd start off. I just ended up starting with general naming conventions. I've moved the slides around a lot in actually. Um, but yeah, general naming conventions. So. Uh, which is interesting, actually, with, with this language. So variables, symbols and methods use snake case. So if you, again, with this, I'm going to assume that every episode I do is self-contained and a number of people watching this may be beginners to programming. So I will explain what might seem simple terminology to some people. Uh, I will explain that um, if it's the first exposure to a language, which could happen. Um, so, yeah, all lowercase letters separated by underscores. 
for example, first underscore name. Um, you'll notice that here, this one's got a colon in front of it. That's a, what's called a symbol. Um, we've got calculate underscore area and is underscore valid question mark. So that last one is a, is a method. And this is you know, probably a, a method as well, depending on how it's used. Uh, classes and modules, and we'll come on to modules later uh, when we talk about things like abstraction in the language. Uh, they use camel case, so each word starts with a capital letter and no spaces or underscores. For example, string, math, active record. Now, of course, if you're not, if you don't have like two words in in whatever it is you're doing, then you know. In the case of variable symbols and methods, it's just all undercase. And if it's a single word in camel case, it's just, you know, one word and the first character is capitalized. Constants use uppercase, all capital letters. And you can see some examples there. Predicate methods, which is, this is really interesting. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to when I explore these seven languages in seven weeks in the book i'm interested if there's other languages that that use stuff like this so predicate methods and that they're methods that return a boolean value end with a question mark so that's pretty cool i thought and then dangerous methods so that's ones that modify the receiver or raise the exception so you know you get these sorts in some languages where they actually sort the contents of whatever they're sorting in situ so and you'll you will you'll see in a moment but so sort ex, sort bang or sort exclamation mark is a dangerous method because when you um, apply it as a method to say an object and that object contains say say it's an array it will sort that array and that will become the new order of that array without assigning it to anything new whereas sort without the bang just sorts it and then you'd if you wanted a sorted version you'd have to assign that to another variable and we'll see that again if you have no clue what i'm talking about it'll make more sense once we look at some code but i wanted to get this out of the way because as you're looking through a lot of these series about is about familiarize yourself with what i call code shapes or what might be referred to as code shapes and uh, that's basically I uh, that's a part of the language I really enjoyed is, is looking at a language and looking at the aesthetics of a language so I've decided to do this first and then finally private or protected methods start with an underscore so for example underscore initialize underscore perform underscore validate I haven't I don't think I specifically touch on this um, too much in the in this um, but yeah if you want to have a private or protected method that's only available inside of like a class um, then yeah you sort of indicate that with a an underscore but also there's certain uh, keywords that you you use as well um, some things for this series I've opted not to necessarily go down that rabbit hole but the whole point is is me to put um, pointers in there for you to go oh, that's interesting I should explore that aspect in the language because yeah I've only got so many so much time to talk about things uh, other naming conventions so Ruby's dynamically typed so there's no fixed types um, and those can change at runtime but Ruby does have some naming conventions for variables and constants that indicate their scope and usage. So local variables start with a lowercase letter or an underscore. They're only visible within the current scope, such as a method or a block. So there's some examples there. Instant variables start with an at sign. They're visible within the current instance of a class. We'll get on to what classes look like in a moment. Um, class variables start with two at symbols. And they're only they're visible within the current class and its subclasses. And then global variables start with a dollar sign. And they're visible everywhere in the program. So yeah. Okay, so let's look at some variables. Good way to start. So you can see here some good examples. We've got local variables. Pretty straightforward. If you've done coding before, stuff you recognize. Oh, got a bit of a auto uh, complete 
issue there. Never mind. I'll, I'll fix that at some point. Um, yeah, so pretty straightforward. You can see here how global variables, how they might look. Um, and you can see here we've got a little method, uh, say hello method, uh, which says hello to Ted. Uh, and you can see just the example, you know, part of it comes from a global variable. Part of it comes from a variable which has come in through being passed in here into the method. There's a constant. Pretty straightforward. OK, what else can we what else code shapes can we look at? So, yeah, instant variables. So here we have a class we've designed defined called person. And later down, we're going to going to use this. We're going to create a new a new instance of person called Ted. Uh, but inside of this class, you can see here, here are our variables. And um, yeah, so these are instance variables. And yeah, so visible in the current instance of the class. So when I create an instance, obviously I'm going to need to have variables that are visible inside of here because I want to use them in this greeter in this sorry this 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 greet uh, method in here so this is my method for initializing the class and then here's my method for the greeting so here you know I'm passing Ted and 25 in here so I create this new object with those as the initial um, variables, and then uh, you know, I'd run if I was to run greet here, put put greet, uh, or actually I wouldn't put greet. I just just put it in in code, and uh, it's got puts in it. So the other thing you'll notice actually, and uh, um, again I'm into meshing lots of different things here. Um, you'll notice that there's no return here, um, and there's a a convention in Ruby whereby if you don't put return in, it will return the last thing done in the method. So that gets returned. So here it's returning this, basically. So what else have we got here? It's interesting. Oh, class variables. So here we go. So we've actually got two types in here. Here's the the class variable that I'm setting to, to zero and they're visible within the current class and its subclasses. So I've also got this initialize method where here I've got the, um, it, so there's a reference here to the instance for name, which is coming in obviously when I create this so what I initialize this with what I initialize this also what it's doing is when I initialize a new instance of this class animal it adds one to the count but it's doing that across you know every instance of that class so if I was to do this the, the answer would be two because I've created two instances, a cat and a dog. And also, of course, to use this, I've got this method here, self.count, which simply just returns that value, that class variable. So conditionals, again, if you're not familiar with the conditional, uh, the statements that control the flow of execution of a program based on certain conditions. Ruby supports several types of conditionals. For example, you've got if else statements, say so execute a block of code if a condition is true, and another block of code if it's false. Further conditions can be checked with additional by adding in else else if inside of the if else, and we'll see that in a moment what that looks like. There's the unless statement which executes a block of code if a condition is false and nothing if it is true. 
case when statements, which exclude a block of code based on the value of an expression, different cases. Um, and these wonderful ternary statements, which I really like, but I do realize they can make code difficult to understand. But they're great short ways of writing if else statements on one line, but um, can get quite complicated. Uh, sometimes I use them um, a lot in returns on methods where, um, you know, I could do a, a one line if statement uh, when I'm returning a value. And maybe I want to return something if there's no value there instead of, you know, having a zero or something else. Conditionals can be nested. And I was going to say it up here, but I'll say it down here, <laughs> which is why I put it in here. It's always considered the most appropriate condition conditionals to use. So, you know, if you're starting to find you're getting a lot of else ifs, else ifs, else ifs if in your if else statements that you're adding in for different clauses, you might want to consider another type of conditional or a different way of structuring it. Sometimes by changing up the logic, you can reduce the amount, interestingly enough. Okay, example of an if else statement. Like I said, this is a lot of this is going to be like, you know, code recognition. Like this is what it looks like. So what do we notice here? Well, one thing, this end statement, you'll notice at this point, we haven't seen any brackets there to come, any braces, any curly brackets. We've not seen any, um, what else would you likely to see? We've not seen any semicolons at the end of lines. What else might you notice? Well, you might notice that in this language, the convention is two spaces indent, as opposed to, say, four that you might find in, um, like you might find in Python, for instance, or no indent if you um, happen to work in the original, um, you know, basic, Commodore basic, whatever you didn't have to indent anything um, but yeah the other thing is um, if logically you've got the positioning correct so you know you've got else is there and you've got the end statement as I have found out on several occasions if you mess up your indentation it actually won't you know slap your wrist in the interpreter um, so yeah just to remember that so you, you can play a bit fast and loose with the indents but the, the convention is this or at least that's what I found anyway and of course that depends a lot on what what you know coding um, like IDEs you use um, I dull things back a little bit when I'm learning new coding uh, simply because I don't want all the autocomplete and that stuff popping up so I'm pretty minimal with my initial installs because uh, I find it actually more frustrating to be auto suggested sometimes sounds strange but yeah um, I'm a bit bare bones when it comes to like where I like to learn new languages a couple of times I've just done it with the command line and uh, a notepad Bizarrely, not with Ruby, but in other languages, just because I wanted to get real, like, back to basics. Yeah, so should look fairly self-explanatory. With some of these, I've got a lot of commenting in. Others, I haven't. Um, on my, the GitHub stuff, yeah, there's a lot where this stuff's quite heavily commented. Uh, I do have, tend to heavily comment when I'm learning a language and then strip it down a bit. Um, I, I also sometimes break some of the cardinal rules of coding as well. Just when I'm learning stuff, like I might um, actually put um, commenting um, in where, you know, I don't probably need to describe necessarily um, how it does it because um, the code should tell me that, but I put it in anyway, just while I'm sort of feeling out the language. So yeah, you see here x equals 10. So we've got an assignment here. 
Um, if x is greater than zero, then it puts x is positive. Else, yeah, x, x is negative. And like I said, there's the end there. Um, so you'll notice already, without me really saying, probably is clear to you now that puts is how you like output to, uh, you know, whatever uh, interpreter you're working in, a Ruby interpreter. Uh, that's how it gets here. It's not the only one, and we'll get onto that later. But yeah, that's the, the the way of doing it. And you probably saw earlier as well on one of the previous examples, there's ways within here of positioning uh, variables. So you're not sort of doing puts and then comma or plus or, you know, all the other ways of creating like a uh, an output and building it up. So that's pretty straightforward, I think. Nothing else really to add there. There's um, else if. You can see we've bunged in a load of else ifs here to deal with different criteria. And it will pull out different things. Now, the other thing to bear in mind with this series is I'm showing you building blocks. Obviously, in real life, stuff like this would be abstracted away inside of a function. OK, so but obviously I don't want to over complicate screens by having all the overhead code on here. So again, I'm just showing you code snippets. Now, that's not to say this wouldn't run. It would. But, you know, a lot of the time this will be inside a larger program or inside of a method. Or maybe I did say function again, didn't I? Method or something like that or a method in a class and so on. So you, you can create standalone methods if you want. You can have methods inside of classes. And then we have the, the dreaded nested if statement. So here, you know, we've got if else ends inside of if else ends. And obviously it will go down, you know, weather's sunny, the temperature is 25. And then it will go through and check this. Now, obviously, like I said, there might be more um, Rubionic. Is that a word? <laughs> like Pythonic. Like there might be more um, idiomatic ways in Ruby of doing this, which hopefully part of the, you know, the my aim with this series is to help you sort of uncover these yourself. So you're either having an aha moment or coding, which is the, probably the best way to do it, or reading up about idioms. And I, I do encourage people, and I will include links in the description to any idioms that might be useful for Ruby. OK, more conditionals. So there's the unless statement I was talking about. So here, y is minus 5. Unless y is greater than or equal to 0, it puts y is negative. And there's, there's end again, you see. So they're using end here. So no curly brackets here. And you will see how they do like blocks of code uh, for other things in a moment, actually. There are other instances where you might have to have a block of code that isn't encased inside of a conditional. And I just wanted to illustrate here how this might look if you, you know, needed to keep the logic in the form it was here but not use unless. So this is what it's really doing under the bottom, you know, is if not this. So instead of saying if not, unless. So I wanted to include this because that's, sometimes you can get these inscrutable logic checks where you think, is there a better way of phrasing that? You know, where I've got if not this. And then you start adding in, you know, not, well, we'll come on to operators in a moment, but I think anybody that's coded will know what I mean. So it's interesting to see these these different formats. Again, with this, to make life just easier, I'm setting the values, obviously, in the code here with these examples. And when you run the, the Ruby code, um, if, you, if you do go to my GitHub um, repository, um, I always did accidentally say suppository when I sometimes say that. Yeah, my GitHub repository. Um, 
if you happen to go there, um, feel the need uh, or the want, then uh, you'll notice there's a lot of this going on. But, you know, normally, obviously, variables would be being passed in in other ways. You know, you might be having some sort of um, user in interaction there, hopefully. Um, so here's a case statement in Ruby. OK, so here Z3. So case said, so you've just got the case and then the particular variable you're casing. <laughs> and then these when statements are for the different values that you want to check for. So you can see it's a combination of when and else is. So, you know, when it's one, then it puts this out, puts this out, puts this out, if it's three and so on. And then uh, put Z is something else here. Now, you'll notice as you play with this, again, I encourage you to play with this, and sometimes I won't always give everything away. It's a bit infuriating, I know, for some people that want everything like delivered up on a plate, but uh, often it's the only way to get people to play with languages is not tell them the full picture. Be artfully vague sometimes, um, because it, it, it does encourage you to try stuff out because anybody else that's used case statements in other language will probably know about how some case statements can sort of waterfall through and ways in which you have to deal with that. So yeah, play around with this, see how it handles that or not, as a case may be. Um, but I think you probably, yeah, a bit of a giveaway here of exactly what's going on. And of course, I could put, you know, other pieces of code in here. Again, I'm keeping this super simple with uh, with the examples on the screen so I don't clog up the screen. And the lovely ternary statement. So here again, I'm just setting A to, to 7. Um, and what it's going to do is on the strength of what A is and whether or not it's greater than 5, um, it's either going to say it's big or it's small. And of course, this is all relative. Um, so in this case, when I put out B, when I put B out, it's going to be, well, seven is greater than five in my universe anyway. Um, and so it'll be the first one. A is big. Now, you probably can notice, and I, I you know, again, experiment, possibly nest these if, if that's a thing. Um, yeah, nesting ternary statements. Yeah. They come with a warning, so just be careful. So loops now. So a number of different loops um, you yeah, can have at your disposal. Uh, the while loop, so loop executes a block of code until the condition becomes false. It's also known as an entry controlled loop because the condition is checked at the beginning of the loop. Then we've got the ever-present for loop. How can we have a language without some sort of for loop? Well, we probably can, but yeah. it's always comforting to have a, to have a for loop. Or a four, in this case, a four in, I suppose, would be more correct. Um, this loop iterates over a specific range of numbers or a collection of items. It's also an entry controlled loop. Do while loop, uh, the loop executes a block of code at least once and then repeats it until the condition becomes false. It's also known as exit controlled loop because the condition is checked at the end of the loop. We'll look at a couple of ways of doing that, actually, um, because there's some... I don't know if the word the word is, I could the word here is appropriate contention or but yeah like a lot of things some ways of doing things are, are considered to be more idiomatic than others and over time I mean you know the creator of um, Ruby Matt is very um, you know prominent in the community um, and you know he has his own feelings about you know do while loops and stuff like that as well so but i'll talk about the, the couple of methods that i've been made aware of and then you've got until loop so the loop executes a block of code until the condition becomes true it's the opposite of the while loop so again interestingly you know we've got interesting reversals here of doing things um, that can be really useful if you might happen to end up with slightly more complicated logic checks on stuff and the until loop can e either be an entry controlled loop or an exit control loop, depending on where you place, place your conditions. Like a lot. And of course, a lot of times here, and you have to be careful, you can put breaks in loops as well. 
Okay, so simple while loop. Bark is four. While bark is greater than one, we're going to do the loop. And each time we do the loop, we're taking one off bark. So eventually bark will get to a point where it is no longer greater than or equal to one. And at that point, we'll just end the loop. So you probably guess it's just going to put out woof, 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 woof to the screen. Or book, 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 book. Um, yeah, so four in loop. If you wanted to do it over, say, a range, like you would do in some languages, then four i in one dot dot five. We'll go around the, the loop. We'll talk about uh, inclusivity and exclusivity in in four in loops in a moment when we get to certain other aspects of the language. But yeah, you can see here, I think what, what it's going to do. So it's just going to put, um, yeah, put I on the screen from one to five. Um, integer dot times do loop. Um, there's an interesting way of doing a similar thing to a for loop. So you can do this thing in Ruby where you do like five dot times do. So there's a method called times, which and again here, see everything's an object. So five is an object. So five would be, I think, if you do object interrogation, which we'll talk about using the class method. Um, five would be, I believe it's when you do it that way, it's called a numeric. I mean, obviously, you know, most people would it here, as I've called it, is an integer. But again, I'll get on to interesting fun and games you can have with interrogating classes and some stuff you can do, because I spent a lot of time doing that in the language. It's, it's great fun uh, to understand what you know, what a object is, um, what methods contain as well, or what objects methods contain is another cool thing you can do in the language. But here, you know, we're doing, um, so yeah, it's going to uh, loop through five times. Now, what interestingly happens here is we're doing this on i, and i is going to start at zero. So this time around, it's zero to four. And so you could sort of see here where this might be useful for things that are zero indexed, maybe. But again, you have to consider usage based on context as well. So just depending on what you're going to do with I and how much less work you're going to do. And also how easy or hard it makes it for other people looking to get your code to understand what's going on if you're using code as comments you can loop over an array like you can in another language so i've got a simple array here and then rather like if you're familiar with python so i can go for item in array and then i can put out the item so i've just got this variable which is also an object in an array, which is also an object. And then I'm just putting out the item. So it's literally going here, iterating over these one at a time. Uh, I can do some clever things actually, uh, which we'll, we'll see again, if, you, if you're observant uh, uh, with, with very, you know, iterations. But again, you know, we got the end here, two in, no curly brackets, no um, semicolon. Semicolon, yeah. Okay, so here we've got an um, example of a, you know, a do while loop. Uh, although, of course, here we're, it's called something slightly different. Um, but uh, I wanted to try and make this relatable to, to other things. So in Ruby, there's a couple of ways you can do it. There's probably a few other ways as well but these are the two main ways that I've sort of come across is a, a like a do break uh, where you're using break um, at the end so you're you know it's emulating a, a do while loop in another language or this begin while uh, begin while loop so with loop do and then this break you can see here we're doing and I've 
you know, done this in other languages where you might be con you might be constantly asking for a command or an input from the user going away doing something and then coming back and it's sort of encased in this do while loop until the user might put in something like exit or stop or you know you've put in a some a prompt in there to say you know if you want to end the program so we're just caught in this loop where the loop starts at the very top and then the end of it the while breakout the breakout is near the bottom so and this is an example of that so we've got you know, puts the thing we're asking we've got this get it so we're getting it back from the user um and we're doing a chomp on it, which is taking off the end of line. So, you know, we can then, because we want to compare it, we don't want our comparison, uh, we don't want the the word that we're checking to have that end of line character in it, because otherwise it won't compare it properly, because it's going to have stop. So if someone types in stop, it's going to have stop and then the end of line character. Now I could suppose I could add that in here, but just chomps a nice, neat way of doing that. Uh, yeah, so it's just going to keep going rounds, doing some stuff until I get the sort of exit command. Just keeps prompting me for the next command. Getting it, doing some stuff and so on. Um, now, yeah, and actually, no, I'll come back to this later. Um, but yeah, so... That's that's uh, the way I can do it. Um, you can see here there's this begin. So begin while. So does the same sort of thing, but you can see the way it's worded because here it's while the condition becomes false. It's checked at the end here doing doing this is this you can see I've rephrased this slightly in accordance with that now the reason why I showed two here is when I first started digging around in Ruby I saw this way of doing it mentioned in and it's more in with the description of sort of do while so loop it executes a block of code at least once and then repeats it until the condition becomes false um, so this is when I first put this together this is the one that I gravitated towards. However, um, I've seen subsequently a move towards this. Now, of course, here it's not quite the same. You're checking to see if the statement is true instead. So I just reword, but it has the same effect there. Yeah. Okay, here's the un until loop doing similar to what I did in the in the regular sort of while loop, but in this instance, you know our, our check is slightly different. Um, where we're doing this until it's less than one. So same thing's happening to Bark. It's going down by, it's, it's decrementing by one each time. Still going to put woof out four times, but with until instead of while. So if we go back maybe to that, you can see here. Oops, the logic is slightly different or the condition I'm checking for because I'm using this until because it's until the condition becomes true as opposed to a while loop where until the condition becomes false okay there's other ways of iterating using methods so here you can see we've got this each method applies a block of code to each element and here we're starting to see for single line blocks of code where we want to sort of you know perform them on something this is where 
curly braces come in. So it's applying the block of code to each element. So just going through here and yeah, simply for each value, putting it out to the screen. So yeah. And here you can see between these bars, if you want, is my variable that I want to use to do that, to sort of pass through in this code in combination with the each method. Then we've got the map method, so you can apply a block of code to each element and returns a modified collection. So here with this, what it's doing is going through the array multiplying each element in the array by two and then you know basically creating a new array for that so again iterating through you can say you know sort of see similarities in the syntax so here's the value I'm sort of using the variable I'm using to iterate through which would so I can then you know do something on it. And another way you can use things like the select method. So another method that works on array objects. And here I can use it to select and create a collection, another array, which is a subset based on, you know, is it even? So here I'm actually using a couple of methods. So I'm using a method on the array object and a method on x whatever object that is in this case it's going to be a numeric because these are integers there's no speech marks around them so it's going to look at it say you know is it even and remember here um with this i mentioned about you know these these question marks like result in a um a boolean return so yeah it'll return it'll sorry put um any values of elements in here that are even into the uh into the collection and then here i'm just printing it out <laughs> okay so operators so if you're not familiar with operators they're symbols or keywords that perform various operations on one or more operands Ruby has many types of operators such as arithmetic, comparison, assignment, logical, bitwise and other miscellaneous types of operators. Some operators are actually method calls, which means you can redefine them for your own classes. So, yeah, you can sort of play around with them. OK, so some common operators. I'm sure you're going to recognize these. Uh, if you've worked in any programming language before, certainly anyone that's done any form of math will recognize some of these. So the usual suspects, we've got things like modulus for the remainder, exponential, that's to the power. So, you know, two, 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 star, star, two, two to the power two. Here's our assignment operator for equation. You've seen already that in use and other ones of these may again come up as I'm going through the code um, you get these other nice compound ones you know where add and assign so you can condense down to um, make things a little easier so instead of things like you know x equals x plus one as I may have done already you can condense that down to x plus e plus equals one so it'll take x add one to it and then assign it back to X. You've got comparison operators. Notice that equality is two equals. I think vast majority of programming languages I've worked in, that is the case, but there are some where the equality and the previously mentioned assignment operator are identical. Inequality Looks like that. Less than, greater than, less than, equal to, greater than, equal to. This interesting combined comparison operator, which you can can use in certain contexts. Again, 
something that's an interesting rabbit hole to, to go down. So comparison that returns a minus one, a zero or a one based on how it's used. And then case equality. So this is specifically used in um, you know, in the case structures. So within, um, you know, within the the case um, uh, structures we saw earlier, basically. And we've got all the logical operators. We've got the bitwise stuff for doing bitwise stuff on calculations and shifts and things like that. And then other ones like stuff for range, turning operators, scope resolution connected with classes, um, method calls, array access, method arguments. Comments. Comments align their annotation with Ruby code within Ruby code that are ignored by the interpreter. It's basically what a comment is. Um, they're used to provide additional information or explanation about the code, such as its purpose, logic, or usage. Comments can be used to temporarily disable some code for debugging or testing purposes. There are different types of comments in Ruby, um, not many, um, but outside of the commonly used ones, you may come across others for use in templates or specific use cases. So a couple of common ones, single line comments. You can put them above uh, to one off to one side if you want to. Uh, there's this one as well, which is this begin end one. Uh, it's a multi line comment. Can't contain any text. Oh, wait, sorry. It's a multi-line comment. It can contain any text or symbols, but it cannot be nested or indented. It's mainly used for documentation purposes. So most comments I do are in this form. Uh, of course, you can just repeat that over and over again and create like a block comment. I did try that style of comment you get in Python, which is what three... Um, apostrophes top and bottom to do block commenting but uh the yeah the ruby uh, interpreter doesn't like it so that doesn't work and of course you can put in again comments all over the place <laughs> obviously you you know with these you want to indent them in keeping with the indentation of the particular part of the the block particular part of code that they refer to and here again, notice we've got very interesting uh, iterator, you know, slightly different way of doing things, maybe. Um, so for each of the numbers in the list, I'm just doing N, so I'm going through them. So here N is used to, uh, to sort of pull these out, I suppose, for want of a better word. Uh, that's where they're going into, into N, so then we can work on N. So here we're we're doing um, an operation. We're doing an operator. Oops, on that. Yeah. So into the power two exponential. Okay. Use comments sparingly and only when necessary. Use clear and expressive code over comments. Um, yeah. So there's the one exception. Like I said, when I tend to learn stuff, I over comment deliberately. But as I, you know, get closer to production code or release code, which is not quite so likely these days, um, I will tend to strip out unnecessary comments where the code is actually doing what, um, you know, the code's explaining it. So, yeah, try to make the code the what. Um, uh, yeah, so if you've got a comment that explains what, look at the code, see if it's obvious from the code what the code does. If it isn't, then maybe make the code, uh, just the way the code's laid out, more more obvious. Um, but primarily, I suppose, use comments to, to explain the why and how of the code, if you can. But like I said, there's you know exceptions to the rule. Um, use comments to document the interface and behavior of classes and methods. 
comments that describe parameters, return values, exceptions, and side effects and methods can actually help other developers understand how to use them correctly and efficiently. Describing the internal logic or algorithm of methods can become outdated if the code changes. So that's one reason to, again, being careful when you describe what code does. If you change the code, you've got to change um, the... Uh, yeah, you've, 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 you know, if you're actually explicitly describing, you know, this checks for X and it stop, it doesn't, you change it so it doesn't, you've got to change the code. Use consistent and standard formatting and style for comments. Follow the Ruby community guidelines and conventions. How can you... How can also use no you you can also use tools like oh okay typo here <laughs> um yeah so you can use tools and uh, I actually took it out so I I left the like in but yeah you can use tools to check and generate comments automatically. So ab moving on to abstraction now. So, you know, we've been looking at code in isolation and we know that object oriented programming um, is a thing in the language. So it's like, OK, where are all the classes and modules? And we've seen a few. So abstraction is the process of hiding the implementation details of a system or component and exposing only the essential features of functionality to the user. Um, so that might be user of the language. You know, maybe you've abstracted um things for other people that are programming other developers out into a um, class or module or method that they can use. Abstraction helps to simplify complex code, reduce duplication, and improve readability and maintainability. Um, also can make it reusable, hopefully. Um, and in Ruby, abstraction is ach achieved using classes, modules, and methods. Classes and modules are abstract data types that define a common interface for a group of related objects or behaviours. Methods are abstract procedures that encapsulate the logic and steps for performing a specific task. By using classes, modules and methods, Ruby programmers can create high-level abstractions that focus on what the system does rather than how it does it. So once you've created that abstraction, you don't have to keep worrying about it. You know, you know... Um, you know that it's going to take care of that for you um, and you don't have to worry too much about how it's doing whatever it's doing. But obviously when you write the abstraction, you do. But once it's abstracted, yeah. So let's have a look at some stuff here. So let's look at classes. So again, simple example, uh, define an abstract class for animals. So we're going to create this class called animals. You can see here we've got things called getter setters. So they allow us um, to have methods for any values that we might be getting or setting in a class, basically, where we might need to, to do that. Um, so, you know, where we're passing variables um, in through through methods and we're going to actually work on the values, you know, outside of the class. So we need to basically interact with with those values and sort of change them in some way. Once they're sort of, you know, maybe set or, you know, whatever, whatever we've else we've done within the class. So we've got our uh, method here to just initialize our animal class um, you know we're going to be having name and age we've also got some generic sounds that these this animal class is going to make when we use the method sound or move so that's our sort of starting point so we have an abstract class for animals then we can start to define a subclass for different types of animals so we can have this dog subclass based on the animal class and we can define um, sound and move in a different way so here sound is gonna return woof 
and move is going to return run. And we can do that for other subclasses. So we've got the subclass of cat with meow and walk and then bird with chirp and fly. So that's our classes and subclasses done and our methods inside of that. So that's now all abstracted away. So now whenever we want to do stuff, we can just go ahead, create a new instant of dog and uh, you know give it a name and an age and we have our new dog instant so our new dog um, and of course we could create lots of different dogs with different names and ages we can create a cat same thing chunky the cat and then we can create bir a bird birdie mcbird face um, and you can see here we're using this new method and then we're passing in the age, uh, the name and the age, which we've already sort of catered for here in the various parts of that. So now when we call the sound and move methods, obviously they're going to re return um, the appropriate sound to that particular you know animal object so we just do these method on dog woof sound with woof you know and so on so yeah so sort of example of abstraction with classes and of course again very simple you can just expand this up and have all you know like in here you know very minimal code doesn't do much but obviously any other stuff we want in here methods that do other things we would we can define in inside of our class and then you know call the methods in similar ways the other thing we can do is is create these modules which i suppose is is a a, a different way round but and you'll see how this hangs together in a moment so we can create a module called drivable that has a number of different um methods in it so we've got the start method the stop method the accelerate method the brake method to keep it simple it's just returning the phrase so start the engine stop the engine increase the speed decrease the speed obviously in real life there'd be a whole load of other code in here that would be doing stuff we then decide to create a module for flying vehicles so take off, land, ascend, descent. I think you can probably see where I might be going with this. So another module here to handle this. What we then do is we can take those modules and include them in classes where they're appropriate. So we've got items here like car, which is a drivable thing. So we can include drivable in there. Same for a truck, same for a motorbike. When we get to a plane, well, that's both drivable and flyable so we can include the modules that contain the appropriate um, uh, methods <laughs> trying not to say function that, it, that include the appropriate methods for those that are in those modules yeah so now you know obviously if we start to try and use these they're going to be the same for all the drivable things that we created um, objects for. So when we, um, you know, at the point at which we um, would have created these and we try and call them. So back here, you know, we've defined these classes. So we've got this uh, car dot start, start the engine, car dot accelerate increase the speed decrease the speed and so on and that's true for any of these where um, the the truck object which included the drivable module which included these methods now of course when we get to the flyable and drivable object like the plane there's a lot more stuff here we can call on to do this which we couldn't use where we've got classes which just have the drivable module in them. So you can see how hopefully you can create all these modules and then just use them, include them in the appropriate class.
classes where you need to. And then, you know, you can build stuff on stuff. So, of course, that then you can get subclasses and so on and yeah, things like that. So Now, obviously, here I'm using them directly. Um, I could be creating instances of these as well. But just for the purposes of the running the code, keeping it simple, I've just simply put, um, you know, done that straight away without doing a new there. So, as I've said, we can also just use methods to abstract things. Just, you know, they might be inside a class, they might not. They might be inside a module, they might not. Um, so here's a simple one, calculating the factorial of a number. So factorial n, and this is, you know, one way of doing it. And so anytime I want to use this, I can just, you know, call that particular method. Now here, it's not a method inside of a class. So as you've seen earlier, there, there, there's going to be different ways of doing this. So here, you do it this way. Now, this raises the question. So if I start doing stuff like this, and I'm calling a factorial method, where am I going to put the error checking code? So that's something you have to decide because I can do factorial minus five. Now the way this code works is it's not going to create an error, but it's going to be wrong. Um, and you'll see that, you know, if you put in zero or one, um, so, you know, there might be some additional defensive code that you want to put in there I can't put any um, interesting I can't put any and I, I'm not going to specifically cover in these because it's more of an advanced topic I feel but I can't put any sort of you know the similar to the try commands in um, in Python you know like exception errors um, so for this there's no way of me putting an exception error in there that's going to catch that I don't think could be wrong so um, well, is that true I could what I could do is I could generate one based on logic yeah actually no I could I could do it that way thinking about it um, uh, you can actually do that so you could you could trap for a, a value and then create an exception off of that but you could also do it by you know, restricting what someone supplies as a, a value before it even gets to that point um, when you're you know, asking the person to input the number that they want to you know, create a factorial for um, at that point. Or if you're using, again, just you know, be mindful. And of course, here, if I was being um, good with my comments, I'd comment in the limitations of this in there but my overall point is you know you you know you abstract through methods as well and I just wanted to point out here just while we were talking about it, I could use recursion for the method so I could call this recursively I'm not going to attempt to explain <laughs> recursion on the stack at this point <laughs> because uh, it will just blow my mind and I'll get tongue-tied. Uh, yeah, just look it up how recursion is handled in Ruby or various languages. Real interesting thing. And again, you have certain considerations when you're you know, calling functions recur methods. Did I say functions? Methods recursively in this language. You know, so you're calling on itself. And obviously, if you do that, um, there are consequences under certain circumstances some circumstances it might be a good thing in other it might be a bad thing and you have to decide you know how you're how you're going to best use a particular abstraction method for methods we could also use something like inject um, so here we could use another method to um, yeah 
So it's using one as the initial value and multiplying each element from one to n. So it sort of goes up from that one, feeding, injecting, if you like, I suppose, the resulting value back in to this every time. So, whoops, i is being incremented from 1 to n. And then each time that happens, that's being pushed back in. Okay, types. As I've already said, Ruby is dynamically typed, which means you don't have to declare the types of variables before you assign values to them. The type of variable is determined by the value it holds at runtime, and it can change as you assign different values. For example, you can assign a, str a string to a variable and then assign a number to the same variable later. However, and the reason why I bring this up again, there is always the danger of trying to perform operations on variables that contain different types. And there are several built-in methods that can help you to you determine a type and to also cast values. That's why I brought it up again, is you know there are methods to help you look inside if you like or look at what something is and i've spent endless hours playing around with this this is real fun and i'll include lots of these in or these ones in my um in my sandpit ruby file um which i'll include i'll say i'll include a link in the description so you know you can take things like you know any variable you've defined so you know, it's dynamic here, so it's making this a string. Um, this is an integer, but if you interrogate this, you'll find that um, in actual fact, um, do a class on it, do a dot class on it, dot class method, doing a class. Um, you'll find it comes back as a class of numeric. So again, you know, don't want to give too much away here because I want to encourage people to play with the dot class method. You know, try stuff out. Try creating a variable that's a float or is um, designated as being something else in some way, which we'll get onto in a moment how you can do that um, in terms of you know, creating certain types of um, numeric values. Um, but yeah, try putting the dot class method onto the object and seeing what it spits out. So, for instance, here we've got another way to do this, which is to do is underscore a is a question mark. So what is it? And it returns Boolean values. You remember putting a question mark is where um, the mod, the I nearly said module there, the uh, method returns a Boolean. The naming convention is such that you always put a question mark at the end. So, you know, what is my string? Is it a string? Well, it's a bit of a giveaway, I suppose, uh, by the naming here. Um, I just did that um, just to make it a bit easier um, here. But uh, there's no obviously no requirement to do that um, in the language. But I just wanted to do that in my code so it was clear because I had like loads of these at one point, like different stuff and changing them backwards and forwards. Um, so yeah, it'll return true for that. Uh, I, you know, it's also an object, so it's going to return true for that. So it's interesting when you do a dot class on it, again, there's a hierarchy to classes. So you can do things like dot class, dot subclass, those sort of things. Again, I'm leaving this open ended so you can play around with dot class and other methods. And I'll talk about a real simple way of seeing what methods are available as well, which I, which I use. Um, yeah. Is um, so, yeah. So on this one, I was doing it on the string uh, on the object one. And of course, I could have done this on on the on the string as well. Um, you know, it's an object. It's an array. Uh, is is this a string? Well, no, it's not. This one isn't. But um, interesting enough, if I return just the first index value here by doing this, and you can see in arrays, you know, similar to other languages, if not the same, 
uh, yeah, correctly, it says, well, yeah, that value is actually a numeric. So, yeah, again, you can do these is A's and classes and whatever on stuff you've extracted, which is great fun. OK, so what types might you commonly see in Ruby if you start playing with the methods I've mentioned? You're going to see numeric, you're going to see Boolean string, hashes, arrays, symbols, stuff like that. OK, so, yeah, as I've said, I recommend trying the dot class and dot is a method on various types. So, you know, stuff like this again, just for convenience, when I'm looking at this, I've given them a specific name, but I didn't have to. Obviously, as I've said, you know, there are naming conventions for this based on other considerations to do with scope, for instance, and um, how something is used, you know, whether it's being used to contain um, like numbers, strings or an object or a method. You know, it's a, a, a label for method. I should get into actually using the term label a lot because it's, it's a better, better term for a lot of this stuff, particularly when you're working in object oriented programming, I think. And everything's an object. Yeah, so you also have things like symbols. Well worth checking out exactly what a, a symbol is. You've seen me using it already. But again, another little snippet of information I'm going to leave out for the moment so you can sort of dig a bit deeper into that. And of course, all of these are, are included in my uh, sandpit file. OK. Yeah, Boolean's fun to change, uh, play around with just to see what you get back. Uh, and it is different if you do a class method on, say, a Boolean that contains false versus one that contains, say, true or nil. Um, because, of course, Ruby doesn't really care. You know, like I can, I could now make this one. I mean, again, I've just named this for convenience. But the underlying type can be jumping around within reason and various other things and what I end up doing with it, of course, that's going to dictate or cause certain problems. And yeah, I could play around with ranges. <laughs> Put a range in something and then see what it comes back with. So yeah, I encourage you to play. I see this, this has been great fun, actually. I'm really glad I did this uh, seri um, series or working on it. You can create enumerators. Um, there's probably numerous ways you can do this. This is one way I saw being done. Where you're sort of adding each of these in to an enumerator. It's interesting as well, you interrogate it as a class. You get it back as an enumerator object. Uh, and if you try and put it as well, it's interesting to see what it looks like. It doesn't look like, say, an array or a range or a set at all and that's why sometimes I'll include these just to remind you to try certain things out um, again you know most of the code I'm showing you is more for experimentation purposes than anything with simple examples and so I might want to unpack this so what's a way in which I can unpack this enumerator and one way I can do this is to do something like this so work my way through the enumerator each item doing a do um, <laughs> like Betty Boo, and here, um, yeah, item, object, and I'm putting out the item. And again, the choices here are going to be, oops, damn, are going to be pertinent to what type of object this is, um, what I'm doing to it, what type of method it is, as in terms of how I'm going to use this part of it. And as you saw earlier, you know, if I had additional code here on this line that I needed to do on each of these, because at the moment I'm just simply iterating through. And when you're iterating through, this is probably all you're going to end up with, something that looks like this. And there's going to be different things in here, obviously, depending on what sort of object it is, what I, how I'm iterating, what I'm iterating. But if I need addition, to do additional things, maybe, then that would might go in here in um, encased in curly brackets. Okay, so one thing I did want to point out here is when you're working with certain things in 
um, Ruby. Well, you should do this in any language. Just be careful that you understand what thing happens with certain assignments, with certain things. Um, and this came about because I was researching pointers, which there's, as far as I know, there's not pointers in Ruby. But it's good to know how referencing works in a language and to play around with stuff like this. So say, for instance, we assign A as hello. So the type there is going to be string, um, if, if you're curious. Not that it really matters in this example. And then I decide to assign A to B. So in actual fact, what I've done here is I've created a, a reference to the same object. So if I now modify A using uppercase bang, so um, I think what do they call them, a dangerous method. Um, yeah, if I use a dangerous method. So that's just going to change A to uppercase. Because B is a reference to the same object, it's actually going to make A and B hello. And I can play with this. So I can go, OK, well, let's make B down. Oh, look, B's now. Yeah, so both are getting changed. So let's add complexity here. Let's make C equal to B. Now what happens? Oh, OK. C, yeah. So, and just as a side note here, not necessarily connected with, obviously if you wanted to, say, make um, an uppercase version of something else and didn't want to change the original um, because you wanted to process it and keep the original un unchanged um, and yeah that's a good, that's the same true with like sorting and any other any any method you know remember that there's usually both a dangerous method and a non-dangerous method and the dangerous method has an exclamation mark now again when you're doing this uh, anything like that where you're assigning values to something else um, look at the context in which it's being done and look at what the assumptions Ruby is making about what you're doing what you're doing and just check it um, just check what that value is and what's going on that's all I'm saying here that's why I'm showing you this okay so things are getting a bit annoying so how might we deal with this well one way is we could do a a dupe or a clone so we can make d equal so you can see here i'm creating a duplicate duplicate which is now d and if i do a down case on d it doesn't change because it actually creates a duplicate and as i said i could use dot clone um but you might want to do some homework regarding the use of dot dupe or dot clone method as there could be unwanted side effects with some objects, different side effects. Um, you're creating, what are they called? Is they, what are they called? I think the term is shallow copies. And um, if you've ever worked in languages where there's sort of discussions of mutability and unmutability, like enclosure, um, stuff like, you know, shallow copies become quite a big issue so yeah just just saying okay other type prefixes while we're on the subject of referencing and defining various things and types um yeah you can you know add additional information through these prefix prefixes uh yeah there's all manner decimal octal hexadecimal binary float um Yep, so you can do that sort of stuff. And again, play with this. See how they look. Check out the look and feel of variables. That's particularly true in, I think, in dynamic typing. Um, you should really get under the bonnet with that sort of stuff. Okay, arrays. So we're onto arrays. Okay, let's create an array. This is how you might create an array in Ruby. And again, there's other ways you can create arrays it's an object so yeah um you can access the fir first element easily yeah, if i wanted to just print out the first element again zero indexing so fruits uh puts fruit zero is going to uh, print out apple um, i can add a new element using this i can also push a new element both of these push the element to the end I can remove the last element by popping it 
I can sort without changing the array. I could create a sorted copy doing this, or I could do a dangerous sort and uh, the method would actually change the array in situ. Hashes. So a hash is a collection of key value pairs that can be of any type. These you might recognize as being similar, if not the same, as dictionaries in Python, if you do Python. You can use hashes to store mappings between keys and values such as dictionaries, phone books, or configurations. I'm assuming, yeah, they're obviously called hashes for a reason in here. Um, and uh, yeah, but yeah, so not called dictionaries, although they can use to be create dictionaries. So we can create like countries and um, capitals like this. And again, there's other ways you can do this if you want to. But uh, yeah, check them out. Um, I can then reference the value by the key like that. I can add a new key value pair like that. Again. <laughs> um, and I can delete a key value pair like that. Obviously here I'm using a delete method. Now, interestingly enough, um, certain things obviously, um, you know, you might not have a, a dangerous and a non-dangerous method in the language. Just saying again. So, and so you just have to work your way through. Hopefully I didn't do a typo there and missed off the bang. I think that's right. Um, yeah, it does get, it's a little bit, I mean, it's good, but sometimes it can be a little bit confusing when you have like both. But I can see the uh, the advantages. And I can iterate over the hash. Again, look, you're going to see this a lot. So iterating key values. So well, yeah, I can pull the pairs out and put them. Again here you can see if I'm doing a do, ah, I have an end. There's a surprise. Now, of course, the exception might be um, if, if if there's a Y in here, and I don't know if we've seen it so far, maybe not. Um, yeah, I mean, generally you get do and end together like that um, on there. I'm just trying to think if there would be any instance where a do wouldn't have an end. Um, so, yeah, something to play around with. Uh, again, like I said, with... Uh, with single line blocks of code. So, you know, this do end is used for multiple line blocks of code. Um, I'm going to be using the curly braces. The other thing here is real notice here. We've got some sort of placement inside going on inside of uh, of text, which uses this construction here. So that's how I'm putting that in there. So, yeah, again, yeah, context is everything. Sets, so a set is a collection of under unordered, unique elements of any type. You can use sets to store sets of items, check for membership, perform set operations, eliminate duplicates. Um, so if I create this set here, doing, doing it this way, again, you know, with a lot of different things, you know, you could create your own, conceivably, your own data structures. Um, obviously, with some structures, you know, you can have stuff inside of stuff as well, um, just to add to the complexity. Uh, I can do checks to see if elements are in the set. I can add a new element to the set. I can delete an element from the set. Again, you'll notice, you know, a lot of different objects might have the same sort of methods 
on them if they do same sort of things. I can also perform set operations on sets and I can just create sets on the fly like this. So I can just create a new set just for the purposes of the operation. So here it's just putting back the union. It's not going anywhere with that. I'm not assigning it to another variable. So this is just checking, you know, in this, in this particular instance, you know, what if I did that operation, that union on this, with a union with this, what would come back? And I've got no uh, no spoiler text here. So yeah, again, you can play around with this. This is in my code. Strings and string methods. So just back back to strings quickly, seeing as, you know, to me, strings and, you know, arrays, you know, you can ac access them in similar ways, really. You know, like a string is what con um, conceptually... Uh, an array of characters um, and certainly if you're used to programming in C you'll be aware of that so I can just create a string called Ruby I can access the first character or the first index character I can uh, concatenate two strings if I want to uh, of course you know you can't always do this with uh, dissimilar objects you have to be careful of that I can reverse a string and this is an important point that I've been this has all been moving towards to me this is one of the, the great things you you can do um you can, you can do this in other languages but it's great fun is to just look at what methods there are for a particular object you may have created or you have access to methods but also dot sort because it sorts your methods in alphabetical order which i love because i hate sc scanning down unsorted lists so yeah remember that probably going to mention mentioning at least one more time Ranges, a collection of values that span from a start point to an end point. Uh, you can use ranges to represent interval sequences or conditional conditions. Uh, so, yep, yeah, numbers equals one dot dot ten, one to ten. Create a range of numbers. We can do that. Uh, we can check um, after the fact if uh, a value is included, and that will return like a boolean. Yep, yeah, true. Um, we can convert a range to an array. There you go, to array, underscore array. We can actually use a range as a condition in a case. Case age, when, 0, dot, dot, 17, whatever here. So you know, notice in cases, this when statement, replaces maybe us saying, you know, is this equal to this? In this case, is it in this range or is it in this when? You remember I said there was triple equals in cases. Anytime you might need to use um, a check for equality in a case statement, that's where you use the triple equals sign. And I'm assuming it's because of the fact that in here, you know, when is doing the heavy lifting most of the time. Yeah. So yeah. But again, something to to play around with, not giving too much away there. Queues. You can create a queue. Yep, there's an ability to create a queue object. Queue.new. And uh yeah, probably obvious now that dot new is used to create a an object of a particular class you may have um, defined or you may have uh, maybe using that's already in the uh, you know in the core language in the standard library oh another bit of a quote quote gaff there happens um, yeah so a new queue and I can add elements to the queue using this I can pop off elements now, if I pop off an element on a queue, they come off as below. So um, adding, adding elements on the queue, so we go, Ada's on the queue, Guido's on the queue, Matt's is on the queue. Pop them off, Ada comes off the queue, Guido, 
and so on. And of course, if I do that, I'm going to end up with an empty queue. And interesting as well to do before and afters on objects to see if anything has fundamentally changed. Then, yeah, not not necessarily the case, but again, you know, dot class is your friend. If you're just curious about the nature of the object. So, yeah, now on to writing files. Um, I've kept this fairly simple and I do accept there's multiple ways and a lot, probably a lot cleaner ways and ways in which you would encapsulate and abstract away these inside of classes and methods and other things, modules. But here I'm just dealing with the raw code. So we can write to a text file and file open the name of the file in fact we want to write to it so we've created this file object here and then we're just writing to the file object so that's going to write oops yep yeah. <laughs> victim of autocorrect here so that should say file dot close without the space um, yeah I was reformatting quickly this morning I must have missed that so yeah that should be file dot close all lowercase. It is correct in my code. Um, yeah, so I've just written hello world to that. I can write to a CSV using the CSV class. I have to do a require here. So require the CSV module. Um, there is something which I'm not going to cover here, but um, of course you've got things like gems in Ruby, which are these sort of external libraries which you can also bring in but i thought for the purposes of you know being new to the language we'd we'd book in that we'd apokay i think that the uh, philosophy term is we apokay that um off for for another time um yeah so but here i'm just requiring um a, 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 a built-in library called csv and uh Yep. So I'm going to CSV dot open for the moment and do a do. Um, and as I do my do, uh, yeah, I'm, you know, popping on if you like or pushing on, pushing on. Yeah. Actually, yeah, pushing on. Sorry, pushing on. Uh, these. This includes headers as well. So I'm just pushing these into the CSV. And it's as simple as that. So, yeah, the great thing with this is um, using the class and its methods. This just exists for the duration of this block. So notice I'm not closing it. So, yeah. It's fun when you start playing around with objects. You can do neat things. OK, reading text files. You put them in, you got them out. Well, if I just wanted to read that text file, pretty easy. I can do a file.read. On the content just works I can do um, uh, uh, a line by line read so again you know a couple of do's here because I'm doing lines um, although here I think I've indented a bit too far yet so this would actually run fine um, but for cosmetic reasons, this end should be over here. So again, slap on the wrist. Um, although I'm going to blame blame autocorrect for some reason. Um, yeah, that should be uh, what, two spaces, as I've said. Yeah. So, but then it's good when things like happen because you can talk about the two spaces. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm doing a file and then doing a line. Um, that's how I like to think about it. So as I'm doing a file, uh, when I, because I'm doing that file, I can do each line of that file and do, and then, yeah, for the line, just put it out. I'm just simply here putting this to screen. Obviously, you'd be doing something interesting with this in real life, wouldn't you? Hopefully, unless you're playing in a sandbox. Um, iterate over each line of users.txt txt and print it so just you know another way of doing that so using for each 
and doing the lines directly. Yeah. So, yeah, again, interesting way of doing iterations on stuff and interacting with uh, certain certain um, classes, objects, modules, you know, whatever. Methods. Uh, reading CSV files. Again, for both of these, I would require the CSV. And again, I can iterate over the each row of the file if I just wanted to do that. If I do it this way, using inspect, so again, you know, I'm just playing around with a few different things here. So you can get, when you go away and play with this, you get a different experience when using different things. That's part of what I, I do when I'm learning a language. I don't always do the most efficient thing. I do sometimes do the more interesting thing just to get me understanding a language. Once I start using it in anger, then that might change. <clears throat> so... Yeah, again, we're using CSV here for each. Um, in this case, we're using the word row here to allow us to, uh, the label row to allow us to inspect each thing. If you do this, it'll put it out as a row, uh, um, an array, like a, an array. So you'll get an array of whatever is on one line of a CSV. Okay, so it's taking the comma separated values on one line and spitting them out as an array. And if it's just one thing, that's going to be an array of one item. However, what I could do is I could iterate over each row and make it know that I'm using headers. So I can do this instead. And if I do that, I could also, um, and again, you can try this yourself without this and see what happens um, so it's more like this but with this code and this I'm really just using it doing it this way because I wanted to show you you know as the row comes out so now with this it's a row object doing it this way okay so we can do this or we can use the index either or we'll do it but again experiment like okay what happens if you inspect this instead what happens what if you try and do this on this yeah is that going to work probably not this one this would yeah, so again, yeah, try it out. And then the good old fashioned, you know, print name puts IO. So, yeah, prompt the user for their name. Now, here I've suddenly introduced you to print. Why have I done that? Well, print doesn't do a line feed. So, print's useful where you want to do something associated with it. So, here I'm going to get my thing, I'm going to chomp it, I'm going to remove the. Uh, line feed and then I'm going to put it the result to the screen because I do want this to do a line feed after it um, if I'm going to do other puts so yeah print if you don't want the line feed puts if you do now again I'm being economical here I'm being artfully vague have a look and see, you know, what syntax you can use with print and puts and chomp and gets and, you know, just saying again. OK, every episode is going to feature the same algorithms and everybody's going to cringe because these are really basic algorithms. So to some degree, nothing to see here. I'm not going to teach you anything new or enlightening about alg algorithms. It's going to be very boring algorithm wise. However, what this is supposed to do and I've bit for my own benefit is I love code shapes and I particularly love code shapes of single symbol algorithms so 
For instance, this is Euclid's algorithm if you use a subtraction method. So that's like in its original old school form. There's a more efficient way of doing this. And, you know, you are simply taking A and B. Um, while A is not equal to B, you then check to see if A is bigger than B. If A is bigger than B, then you take A from B, make it A. If B uh, was bigger than A, then you take uh, B, you take A from B, <laughs> probably saying this the wrong way, take B from A and make it B. So either A take away B and make it A or B take away A and make it B based on whether A is greater than B. And you do that in a loop. Um, and by the magic of Euclid's algorithm, uh, you end up with the lowest common denominator. That's what it does. It works out like the lowest common, sorry, the lowest common divisor. Okay, so two numbers, what are the lowest common divisor? Um, and if you want to know more about Euclid's, uh, I'll, I'll include a link to it actually, because I'm not going to attempt to explain the ins and outs of it, because I'll, I'll mangle it. Um, there is a, a quicker method using the modulo method. Um, maybe Euclid didn't have access to that, probably didn't have access to a computer. Um, I wanted to do it using, it's cool as well if you've seen it done with squares. Yeah. So old school with squares. But yeah, modulo speeds it up quite a bit. So you can use modulo. Um, and if you can't remember what modulo, modulo is, yeah, you can always wind back, watch the earlier part of the video. So it's like, um, you know, you're, you're looking, you know, you're dividing um, one number by another. And rather than just doing a straight division on something with modulo you are looking at to see you know what part of a essentially doing an integer division what might that have what effect you know what what it, what do you end up with and within um within um euclid within the euclid's algorithm that's a sort of shortcut for doing you know the algorithm is this use of modulus this use of finding the remainder there right there i've said it um yeah this use of finding the remainder to basically help you now the other cool thing here is and you probably may have seen this already and I, maybe i didn't flag it up or maybe we'll see it in a moment again is this interesting swap you can do in Ruby without too much hassle of just doing A and B equals B and A mod. So here what's happening is it's swapping A with B and then B is putting in the modulo, the remainder of A divided by B. Now, I'm going to come on to it in a moment because maybe people have spotted a problem with uh, there is a problem when you're using that that the first algorithm versus the second one and it's to do with again this object of defensive programming but i'm going to move on to the next algorithm linear searches so here's what a linear search again highly unlikely there's there's some okay there are some instances where you might want to use a linear search but generally it's a sort of search that people learn first when they're learning about searching Obviously, if you're doing searching, you're going to use an inbuilt method to do that, which is, you know, been optimized. Um, but it's a good algorithm to look at um, because it involves like iterating through um, an array. In this case, so we're taking an array, we're taking the value we're looking for and we're iterating. We're, we're doing here, um, iterating through um you know, each element in the array using index as a way of, um, you know, keep, um, yeah, keeping tabs on where we are. So, you know, we're starting with an index of zero and we've asked it to do it with the index and then we're returning that index. If we don't find any value, we return nil. So obviously you would need to encapsulate that in other code to make it, you know, all of these are just 
abstractions of a method and that method would have to be used somewhere. Um, so again, it's a code shape thing. Um, and this is for the purposes of the different languages I'm going to cover. So I'm going to, like I say, always feature the same algorithms. But I'm curious as how they look in different languages. I want to keep it simple. Bubble sort, another algorithm. Yeah, there's probably a few cases where you might want to use a bubble sort. Um, inefficient. Um, you know, once you start talking about, um, you know, things like time and complexity um, and resources, like, you know, that's different ways of assessing different algorithms in terms of how, you know, useful they are, what utility they have under certain circumstances. So I've decided to go for the simple bubble sort. And again, it's leveraging this useful feature here. But there's a number of interesting features that it, it does in this. And again, there's multiple ways you can do this with iterations and use different iterators. I thought it'd be interesting here to, uh, you know, again with these, try and mix it up a bit just to see what code shapes might look interesting. So you can see here we've got a times thing. So n minus one times. So we're using the times method on our um, on n, which is just the length of the array. We're bringing in an array. Um, and we're going to do this that many times, n minus 1, n minus 1 times. Then we've got the inner loop, because we basically, all you're doing with the bubble sort is you're going up the up the array, saying is something bigger than something else, the, the two values side by side, and swapping them systematically <clears throat> until they're in the right order. So you just work your way, continually sort of going up, and up again, multiple times, over and over again, until they end up sorted. It's like, you know, it's a brute force algorithm, I suppose. There's no nuance to it. There's no divide and conquer, really. Anything like that. So all we're checking is, well, is the value bigger than the value next to it? Now, obviously... We've got to be careful when we're doing stuff like this that whatever comparisons we do, we don't bounce over over the array. Interesting enough, if you do that on an array in uh, Ruby, it returns nil. So the program itself won't crash and say, you know, your array references out of bounds. Or at least when I did it, it didn't. But you do get a nil back. And if you get a nil back, that could cause a logic error uh, in your code if you haven't allowed for that. Now, the way you do it in things like sorts is you just don't reference the, the index that's going to be out of bounds. Um, another interesting thing with this is if you've ever done this, you might notice that your loop, um, your inner loop is minus two De again depending on how you've done the loop and how you're incrementing um, I took an opportunity to use three dots here and if you remember back to when I was talking about ranges three dots is an exclusive range so it does from zero to here n minus one but um, it only goes up as far as the value before n minus one so if n is 9, n minus 1 is 8, this only goes up to 7. If you wanted to include, do it an eighth time with n minus 1, you would just do double dot here. So the other way I could do this is the two dot version and then this n minus 2. And it brings up an important point. And again, I'm playing a bit fast and loose here with usage just because to make it more interesting, to give you to give my, me more things to talk about um, and to basically make me think about looking for similar structures in other languages when I come to do the algorithm in another language. I've you know, like I said, there's other ways of doing this. But. 
this bit, you know, same, same old, same old, you know, with using I here, going through here, no additional calculations here, but I've, again, this here is a do, so it is in a block with an end, this is a do in a block with an end. You know, I'm not just, um, you know, performing some other block using the curly braces instead. Uh, on here, I've got to go multi-line because of this if uh, array. I'm sure, and I'm just looking at this going, yeah, I bet there's a way of doing this using a ternary operator. <laughs> but, don't know if I want to do that. Um, yeah. I don't know if there is. I don't even want to try it, I don't think. Um, yeah. And again, you know, I get down here, return um, the array once I've done all the, the brute force bubble sort. But um, here, as I pointed out earlier, I think, if I remember to, I don't. you don't have to include return in Rust. Rust? Ruby, sorry, in Ruby, good. I nearly said Ruth, I nearly said, then I said Rust, I meant Ruby. In Ruby, you can just do this and it just returns that value. Um, there are some times when I do put return in a function if it if it's needs it, you know, I like to make it a bit more obvious. Um, and obviously if you do want to return at a point where it's not going to be, there, there's some, what you call it, confusion, then you do need to use return. But if 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 it's just going to be the last thing it does before the end of the, before, you know, the, um, the module, before the, sorry, the method, damn it, before the method ends, um, then, uh, yeah, before the method ends, then, yeah, you can do that. Okay, so three things to remember. Everything is an object, or well, three things with object. Everything's an object in Ruby. If you want to find out what methods an object you, you has access to, then do that dot methods to, to see those. And conveniently, dot methods dot sort will give you a sorted list. And I find, thoroughly recommend you use it. And finally, uh, I think this is the final page here, it is GitHub. Uh, remember to check out the Ruby files uploaded to GitHub. The code featured it is in the file sandpit.rb in the learn to code slash o one underscore ruby slash core underscore concept slash folder uh, links to those and other resources are in the video description along with links to ruby language resources and set up instructions to start coding in ruby or at least links to the setup instructions if you find this series useful and think others would find it useful and they are willing to tolerate my um, misremembering words and getting stuff mangled up and all the other things i am wants to do in a video then please share and uh, I think you've got enough information now to get started so either you have that or you're completely confused um, so now it's time to learn to code so yeah good luck and finally please comment if you've got any questions as I've said um, the follow-up video is really dependent on what stuff I uncover in the next two weeks or stuff that people comment about and i'm hoping you know within about a week or so of doing this video if there is a need to do a follow-up video or i need to roll my sleeves up and fire up um, visual studio code and just talk to that i will so thanks once again for watching thanks for tolerating this video and uh, bye for now and i will catch you in the next video